Good morning and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes, joined by our colleague Jonathan Last, the executive editor of the Bulwarks. Good morning, first of all, Jonathan. Good morning, Charlie. I think I, I said to you before we started, my kids all got up at all got up at 4 a.m. this morning. So I uh, I am ready to rock and roll today. Well, my dogs got up at five o'clock, so we are deep into the day and we have something in common. This is one of those weird moments where, you know, you're sitting at the ocean. I'm sitting looking out at a beautiful lake in Wisconsin. You're on the East Coast. And I mean, it, the world looks beautiful. And if, if you just like leave aside the fact that you know, people are still dying and that the world is going crazy. I want us to start off on this because I got this. It's just it's it's a little obsessing because I'm reading a story. Uh, I think Ben Collins wrote it for NBC about you know uh, if you have a friend who has just suddenly decided that masks are for slaves and that there are gangs of pedophiles out there and that only Donald Trump can save America, uh, you're not alone because these QAnon conspiracy theories have just exploded through Facebook, et, et, et cetera, and you. Now, think about the, just the news. I'm just making the notes for what we're going to talk about. So we got the president pushing out Birther 2.0, you know, the fight over mail-in uh, ballots. We have a congressional candidate in Georgia. She's going to be a congresswoman. Uh, yesterday, we, we knew that she was a racist QAnon supporter. Today, we find out that she's also a 9-11 truther. And you go, God, I mean, people, there's a large portion of, of our fellow Americans who are just freaking crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. If you ever, so if you ever talk to somebody who deals with like ab the absolute masses, so like doctors and nurses who work in emergency rooms, people who work in DMVs, just people who who literally take an entire cross section of life, they have always said to me that they think that ten percent of the country is literally insane. Like one in ten people are just absolute loons. And I always thought to myself, oh, come on, that's too much. It can't really be. Over the last four years, I've decided that's got to be an undercount. Yeah, it, it it might be. And then there's a different kind of just crazy. I just think it's the stress of the moment right now but I, because every once in a while I'll look at people on Twitter who I've followed for years and it occurs to me they're in the process of having a nervous breakdown. And maybe that's understandable because of how weird everything is, the – the anxieties, the uncertainty, all of the stuff. But but you can tell that that this country is under a lot of strain and it's not going to get better. So I want to talk about Kamala Harris. I want to talk about whether Joe Biden is really the dangerous radical who's going to destroy America. Oh, I mentioned right before we started this, I got a fundraising letter at home from Dan Crenshaw, who is the the uh, congressman from from Texas, uh, who. Uh, you know, the thinking we, man's Matt Gates. Well, that was the take, and I wish I had the email in front of me. I mean, the email, the the letter in front of me, because he's he's all in on like you know that the left wants hates America. They hate God. They're going to destroy everything. I understand, by the way, that that in some of his e in some of his fundraising letters, he sends out actual eye patches. That can't be true. I I. I can neither confirm nor deny. I heard the same rumor as you. Come on. It sounds crazy. Uh, it'll be a good gimmick when he runs for president. Oh, I, 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 I don't know. That's There's a cringe factor to all of that. Uh, so I want to get to all of that. So where do we start? We, I want to talk about uh, Kamala Harris. Well, let's start about start with, with what happened at the White House yesterday. I mean, we can talk about the crazy out there and the stress out there and the conspiracy theories. This was the president of the United States yesterday. I heard it today that she doesn't meet the requirements. Uh, and by the way, the lawyer that wrote that piece is a very highly qualified, very talented lawyer. I have no idea if that's right. Okay, we should back up. He's talking about Kamala Harris. There was this crazy ass piece in Newsweek by a lawyer named John Eastman saying, you know, she might not actually be eligible. Now she was in fact born in the United States the natural born citizen, but her parents were not were not citizens at the time she was born. So here we go again, JVL. Here we go again, Bertha 2.0. Yeah, it's it's blood and soil. I mean, this is literally what what this argument is about. So the the Claire Monsters, the people from Claremont and the Claremont Review of Books who pushed the Flight 93 election and have pushed very hard on the idea of eliminating birthright citizenship, which you will remember was a thing that Donald Trump was absolutely going to do that never mm -hmm. happened. Like we spent, what, nine days talking about birthright citizenship. And it was the classic Trump says this thing that 70 percent of America disagrees with. 
conservatives who have never before in their lives talked about it suddenly decide that yes Trump is absolutely right and we've got to defend this to the death because we got to abs- you know we we can't actually have a country unless we eliminate birthright citizenship thank god Donald Trump is here to do it and then as soon as Trump drops it all those people go silent you know like this thing that they had gone to the mattresses to defend suddenly becomes uh, just down the memory hole so this is the the heart of the argument against Harris is that her parents were not citizens uh, she was born in America and therefore they think that you should be have to be both an American citizen by right of soil by being here and by blood meaning that your parents were also citizens and that is not how this country works no it just isn't. And it is not how people want it to work. I mean, this is a, you know, there's been polling on this for forever and a day. And the vast, vast, vast majority of people want it to be like this. This is what this country is. We are a nation of immigrants. It has always been thus. And uh, I, there is almost no way to look at this except as an incredibly ugly, racist, and xenophobic. Thing. I don't know and how the, else, the idea that yeah. Newsweek published that piece, honestly, with the you know we're just asking questions. They even then appended an editor's note saying that this piece of ours is absolutely not racist. I just, <laughs> boy, when you have to say that, yeah, when you have to go there. Well, uh, look, I sometimes I worry that I'm excessively cynical. I read that yesterday. And of course, you know, it has been debunked. This whole idea has been debunked over and over and over again. If you're born in the United States, you're, you're physically born there. It, it is not an issue. Oh, when, when Trump was asked about it, the first thing he said, I, we don't have it in the soundbite was, well, is this because um, the, the questions about her eligibility is because she wasn't born here, right? And then the reporter had to say, no, she actually was born here. But so he clearly doesn't know a lot about it, except somebody showed him the article and told him that Eastman was this highly respected guy. But I read it yesterday and I'm thinking, oh, this is just ridiculous. This thing has been blown up over and over and over again. There's not a shred of credibility to this. But then I remember thinking, and within a week, it will be everywhere in conservative media. It will be viral. I guess I was not cynical enough to realize that the president of the United States would actually, from the White House, give it oxygen. So, but but JVL, what is the political upside to this? I mean, it is this doesn't strike me as the kind. I mean, yes, it's a distraction. Yes, it's another you know bright shiny object that he can throw up. Yes, it's something else for his base. But this doesn't strike me as a particularly effective political line. Am I wrong? Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, what what is Trump's electoral pathway? It isn't it isn't capturing undecided voters. It isn't catching people who don't like both of them because he's losing that crew by twenty percent, right? If you look at uh, the the polls among people who who have bad opinions of both Trump and Biden, they're I think plus sixteen or plus twenty Biden. Um, Trump's only possible path to victory through legal means is to have such a crazy high turnout amongst his diehard base mm-hmm. that in a weird low voter environment because of COVID and because of other stuff, he is able to luck into another, you know, inside straight where he loses the popular vote and, and pulls out 278 electoral votes somehow. And I everything he has done over the last six months has been really in furtherance of that situation, right? I mean, you know, there was no right. reason for him to get involved in the George George Floyd protests, except that he knew that this is what his people wanted, even though if it was wildly unpopular with the country at large. And this is, I think, again, the same thing. He's he's just playing to his people and giving them what they want. I think this is exactly right. And, and it, it leads to the other point, this weird alliance or tolerance for the most bizarre conspiracy theories out there, QAnon, for people you know, from the, the rational part of America who are looking at the Republican Party going, OK, you have a complete nut job who just was nominated in, in, in Georgia. And she believes all kinds of weird, bizarre things. And yet the Republican Party is basically saying, hey, yeah, welcome aboard. Uh, Kevin McCarthy saying, sure, you know, she's going to be welcomed. But I'm going to give her a, you know, a committee assignments. And the reason for this is that if this is the Trump Republican strategy right now, then they have to allow the QAnon nut jobs into the tent, don't they? I mean, this is this is the wink, wink, nod, nod. We saw them do it with the alt-right four years ago. And now it's QAnon. It's like green light. Yeah, you're OK with us. We're OK with you. Yeah, I think QAnon is actually just the next level of the Trump loyalty test. 
right? I mean, you know, all along there's, you know, how you, you got to prove to yourself that you're really down for this guy. And at first it was, you have to be anti-immigration the way he was. And then it was, you got to vote for him. And then it was, you've got to be anti all of the people who don't like him. And now we're at the stage where you can't really be part of the, you know, the Trump 100, unless you're also open to QAnon. You yeah, know, QAnon. Oh, oh. and I, I gotta say, I, I really do believe that QAnon as a political movement is likely to outlast Trumpism. And I think that this is just the beginning of the QAnon invasion of Congress. I expect more super safe seats because uh, this is, again, one of the things that gerrymandering does is it allows mm -hmm. you to get crazy people in office, you know, because if you have people who come from districts that are like plus 45 one way or another, then anybody can can any nut job can wind up uh, getting elected. So I, I think we're going to wind up with an actual QAnon caucus and kind of the way we had a Tea Party caucus. And uh, nobody it will be interesting. There will be some people in pointy headed conservative incorporated, I think, who will feel as though they have the leeway to to say no to them because their readers aren't QAnon readers uh, and their subscribers aren't QAnon subscribers. But in the precinct of actual electoral politics, Republican electoral politics, I think that it will be essentially impossible to be anti QAnon. Uh, you know, we've been joking with with one another that the QAnon caucus may be actually larger than the number of uh, anti-Trump uh, members of of Congress, and and that may that may actually be true. Um, in my newsletter this morning, I actually had you know Christian Vanderbrook's tweet where he said uh, it's what is it it's easier now to be a, a you know a supporter of QAnon than it is to be a you know a defender of of Mitt Romney, which, which oh, is oh yeah, well, this which, is which is tragically literally the case. Do you and see some Kelly Loeffler is having a big Twitter yeah. fight with some, who is it? Some other Republican, I'm forgetting who, about he, this guy's past support for Mitt Romney in 2012. Right, but Doug Collins of all people. Doug Collins, right. And so, I mean, on the one hand, I'm sorry, does this mean Kelly Loeffler voted for Barack Obama in 2012? I mean, it, it's insane. But on the other, it just highlights how Mitt Romney is much more toxic if you are in Republican circles than than QAnon is. And that that just has to tell you something very meaningful, I think. In, yeah, here, here, here's his tweet. Yeah. It, it is easier to be a Q believer or a 9-11 truther in today's GOP than it is to support Mitt Romney. And, you know, you're tempted to go, ha, no, actually, at the moment. Speaking about the way the 9-11 truther, what we're getting at here is this, uh, this, the, this, she's going to be a congresswoman from uh, Georgia, and she is going to be accepted by the Republican caucus. Kevin McCarthy, is, it has already made that clear. The president has tweeted out what a great champion she is. Um, they're unearthing other crazy things she said, including this. This is her talking about 9-11. We had witnessed 9-11, uh, the terrorist attack um, in New York and the plane that uh, crashed in Pennsylvania and the so-called plane that crashed into the Pentagon. It's odd. There's never any evidence shown for a plane in the Pentagon. But anyways, I won't, I'm not going to dive into the 9-11 conspiracy. Oh, please tell us more. Um, <laughs> really, I, please, I, I, please dive in. Yeah, yeah, we, we are listening. It's, of course, just um, what I mentioned. Of course, there's lots of evidence that there was a plane at the Pentagon. I mean, so this is this is where we're going. You know, I I, I wrote about the anti anti Trumpers out there and um, I, I, could, I could have named a lot of others. But but I, I, I focused a little bit on Rich Lowry from from National Review, who has been really passionate in attacking never Trumpers. Um, and he had, he had a tweet the other day about uh, this is what you, with a picture of of the Democratic convention coming up that John Kasich and uh, and Bernie Sanders would be speaking. He said, "Well, this is this is what you never Trumpers have signed up for." And my pushback was, "Well, you know, um, Rich, what have you signed up for? Uh, you know, I mean, a party dominated by you know the Q Q, Q types, uh, truthers, folks like this." Uh, you 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 buy it. You buy the whole. You buy the whole pig. You know. You buy the whole thing. Um, but it is tough. This anti anti Trump stuff has got to be psychologically tough to actually wreck. And I'm talking about the people who actually have no illusions about how awful all of this is. How what off what what's happening to the Republican Party. What a disaster Donald Trump is, and yet are absolutely committed to not doing anything about removing Trump from office. It it, it it's got to be. It's got to be kind of a painful psychological moment. I mean, their hands are clean. They can, you know, wait up in the mountains. 
until the battle is over and then come down and shoot the wounded and all of that stuff. And then they stay relevant, right? They keep their donors happy, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be kind of grinding to, to know how bad this is and yet be more passionate in attacking other people who actually want to do something about it. You know, I, yes. And I can understand, I can understand the position if you really, really believe that the Republican party and the conservative movement not only must be saved, but can be saved. And uh, I just, I just am not in that place. I don't, I don't, I look at, <laughs> look at this stuff, look at the yeah, QAnon well. stuff. Uh, I don't know that, I mean, the Republican party is what it is. And the conservative movement is what it is. It's not going anywhere. When we talk about burn it all down, you know, it, that's more like a fantasy than anything else. Yeah, like we, we, happen. there is no burning. It's going right. to be here. It will be, uh, either a rump regional party or it will be a national party with a 50 50 chance of winning the presidency every four years. But but the intellectual and attitudinal shift among the voters themselves, not among like people who write for magazines and stuff, is that they want this stuff. The, the Republican voters have signed up for this. This is the party and the movement that they want. And not all of them. But a big enough chunk to, I believe, control the nominating process going forward in most cases. You had an interesting back and forth with David Brooks from The New York Times. He had a column where he cited you and what you said about the you know, the Trumpy future of the, of the party. And Brooks has laid out the this other these intellectual alternatives, you know, all of the intellectual ferment that's that's going on. Um you basically don't think that's the way the party is going to go, that, that, that this is not going to be a party about um, think tanks and in, 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 intellectual principles. Yeah. And, and believe me, this is something that was painful for me. I know. Uh, right. You know, I my general view is that it turns out that the conservative movement over the last 20 or 30 years or so was really incidental to the will of the conservative voters and Republican voters. And, you know, people at AEI and Heritage, and all, they, they came up with policy ideas to justify what the voters were asking for. Uh, and the voters have decided that they, they found something else they can ask for, right? And they can ask for this pure, like European style, right wing, you know, ethno nationalist stuff. And they love it. They really, really love it. And the idea that Josh Hawley is going to get you Trumpism without Trump, and that what voters will really respond to is an aggressive package of legislation to regulate Facebook and Twitter. And that what they want is not. Trump going out and saying that Kamala Harris probably isn't eligible to be president. Like that's just a misreading of the voters. You know, <laughs> like they they don't want they don't care about Facebook and Twitter being regulated. They want somebody standing out and saying, "Yeah, that brown lady shouldn't be president." So you you actually quoted Lenin in your piece. In yeah. the original in the original Russian, I believe. I I did. Uh who whom, right? This is the 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 classic Leninist, uh, which is who obliterates whom, is the only thing that matters. The, the question is not whether the, the policy is this. Or policy, it's just who has power over, over others. And that turns out to be, again, not all Republicans. I'm sure there are plenty of very nice suburban country club people who are just in it for the low taxes. But for some very large percentage of the Republican voting population, and I don't know if that percentage is 30 percent, 35 percent or 60 percent. But it's probably enough to dominate the primary process going forward. What they want is the tweets. That's that's what mm -hmm. Trumpism is to them. And there's it's not, a payoff it's, to them it's not in spite of the tweets, it's what they right. want. Who yeah, the, who the obliterates tweets are the point. Who, who obliterates whom? Is it whom? Yeah. Like, whom? Mm -hmm. uh, who who triggers whom? Who beats whom? Who owns whom? That 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 is the beating heart. And I gotta say that I I agree with you on all of this. My great shock, of course, was, and, and, and again, looking back, I feel, I feel so naive that, that all of these conservative ideas and principles that we kept talking about and writing about, this was like you know, this uh, paper thin crust over the molten lava of what really was going on out there. And was so, which explains why they were so easily, uh, you know, thrown away, you know, free trade, fiscal conservatism, all, all of, all of that stuff. We were kind of talking to ourselves and, um, I, and I, what I see is guys like Josh Hawley and Marco Rubio and others sort of like, you know, 
playing costume. And they're, they're, they're going in the closet and they're trying on certain outfits saying, hey, you know, if I wear this in 2024, will, will this work? And, and, and they'll, they'll discard them the moment they become inconvenient. But you can just sort of see the shape shifting going on, the cosplay going on uh, on the right. But to think that this is really about intellectual ferment, I think, kind of misses what you just identified. Yeah. And for Rubio, this would be his third iteration. I mean, so he was the Tea Party small government constitution guy when he was running for office in Florida. Then when he ran for president in 2016, he was essentially compassionate, conservative, neoconservative American greatness guy. Uh, and now he is Trump light or something. It's hard to, hard to even really say. Anyway, so I, to be clear, I think that in 2024, Republicans might be able to get away with that if nobody else from Trump world decides to actually go and be Trump again, I just don't think that that's realistic. You're going to get a J.D. Vance or a Tucker Carlson or a Don Jr. out selling the same stuff Trump was selling. But they won't be Trump with the exception of Don Jr. Um, and I just want to, you know, for people who think that we're not dystopian enough here, just remind people that if uh, Trump does lose in November, which I don't think, by the way, is a certainty, um, he would be eligible to run in four years. And if he did run in four years, here's your quiz, who would beat him in a primary? So, I mean, so and not only is he eligible to run, I, here is something I can absolutely guarantee you. If he loses, he will tease running again in four years for as long as possible, whether or not he intends to do it. Oh, I completely... Because there is power and money in that, right? I mean, it, 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 it'd be crazy relevant. not to. And right. It, if he does that, the whole rest of the party is frozen. You know, like you can't even start standing up the you know real exploratory campaigns or trying to establish it. All you can do is just sort of wait on the sideline and hope that neither he nor John Jr. decides to run. No, I think that two scenarios that are completely plausible... And I, and I try to avoid the paranoia. I really do, seriously. Uh, is that he will try to claim victory on election night because of the you know in-person voting versus uh, mail-in voting. Um, and, if, and if in fact he does lose, he will. It will be. It will launch this grievance movement that he was uh, you know unfairly deprived of the presidency, which will then dominate American politics for months and months and months. And then, as you point out, then he will at least throw out the possibility that we can right this terrible wrong four years from now. He may not mean it. He may have no interest in doing it, but he will want to stay in the spotlight. He will want to remain relevant. And as you point out, uh, you want to talk about a worst case scenario for the Republican Party. He freezes everybody else. OK, so let's talk about Kamala Harris. And uh, you had a great piece talking about the real confusion coming out of the box um, among Democrats who really are having a hard time deciding whether or not uh, Joe Biden is this terrible anti-American radical or whether he's sleepy Joe. I mean, we're asked to believe all sorts of contradictory things. Talk about that. Yeah. I mean, you can, in, in a weird way, you can tell that the Trump campaign never really took the idea that Biden would be the nominee seriously. They had a playbook to run against Bernie and they were hoping to get Elizabeth Warren, but they, they, they were ready to run against Bernie. And then when Biden became the nominee, they never invented a new playbook. Like they just they're just running the 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 plays that they had, uh, you know, mapped out to run against Bernie. The, the dangerous guy who hates God and is going to uh, uh, turn us into socialists. And, you know, and that just isn't Biden. I mean, Biden has never been that guy. Biden has always sat squarely in the middle of the Democratic Party. He's done it for 45 years. He's not going to stop doing it now. That was the secret to how he won the primaries, is that he positioned himself in the middle of where the party actually was. And I just have a hard time believing that that's going to work for Trump this time. Uh, again, I you know you look at the polling on this. Biden has had a consistent lead of five to six points the entire way up until uh, the George Floyd protests, at which point his lead doubled. And if you go back and this is something I've sort of forgotten about, if you go back and look at the polls starting in spring through October for 2016, so the matchup polling between Hillary and Trump, that went up and down a bunch. Uh, there was a lot of noise in that. Both candidates had surges. Both candidates had dips. There were a couple times when Trump was ahead of her. Her lead was not really more than seven. And even the seven point leads were ephemeral. They would only last for a week or so. Uh, 
the Biden lead has just been rock solid. I mean, he's he's been at where he's been at, which is 48 to 51 percent almost the whole way. And Trump has been where he's been, which is 39 percent to 42 percent, basically the whole way. And I, I just think that that is the nat- that is the natural steady state of this race. And it's hard for me to see how it changes. Uh, no, I, I tend to agree with you, but I, I, I had Sarah, uh, Sarah Longwell on the podcast the other day, and she made a point. Um, she said that uh, when they do focus groups, she's finding that there's a lot of people who are just now paying attention who have not been tuned in. So I'm, I'm, tr- I'm trying to reconcile these two things because it, there has been this real solidity in the polling, which makes me think that Americans have made up their minds one way or another, that, that, that we've, you know, You've had three and a half years of Donald Trump. You're either going to like him or you're not going to like him, and nothing is going to change that. Versus this, well, there's a lot of voters out there that are just starting to think about this now. We have been obsessing about this for four or five years now, but this election will be decided by people who are going to, who are going to, I don't know, wait until after the World Series to start uh, making up their mind. What do you think? You know, I have a hard. I'm, I'm sure there are some people who do that, but I have a hard time believing that the universe of those people is big. I mean, for one thing, the polling suggests that. I think we're down to like 13% of the electorate has not made up their mind strongly one way or another. Uh, you, I mean, just look at the the Nielsen ratings for the national broadcast news programs, you know, the nightly news programs. They're the highest they've been in like 30 hmm. years because people are watching the news again. Uh, this is all because of COVID. I, I have a hard time believing that in the midst of this pandemic in which we've all become intensely high news consumers, that people really are just tuning in. And And the other side of this is, I mean, when we've talked in the past in presidential elections about low information voters, when you're really low information, then what all you really get is the environment, right? You don't you don't really get the nuances between candidate one and candidate two. And so what you do is you look around, and you say, hey, you know what? Uh, My interest rates are really low. My job is great. Uh, My in my parents are happy in their retirement. you know, our plant is strong down at the, the the shop that I work in and things are good. OK, I'm going to vote for this guy or you get uh, things are terrible. We're in a massive recession. I have either lost my job or I'm afraid of losing my job, in which case you decide uh, we, we got to make a change. I think it's hard to think that there are a lot of people in America who are so low information that they are just now tuning in, no, who are going to look around them and say, well, we got 160,000 dead people. Unemployment is 11 percent. Uh, yeah, no, no. Let's just let's just keep doing this. Let's yeah. let it ride. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm. Let's, let's talk about the, how how Kamala Harris plays out. Uh, I've, I've been ignoring the the insta polls that show you know how people are reacting over the first twenty four hours because you know these narratives develop. Um, it was it's considered to be a you know the conventional safe pick for Joe Biden, but I think maybe it's an indication of what's conventional and what's safe. You know, she she does strike me as a much in terms of the possible you know possibility of changing a little bit of the of the race of say a much bolder pick than say Tim Kaine or you know John Edwards was uh, or you know Mike Mike Pence was uh, how how do you think uh, Kamala plays we're not Kamala Harris fans i think we got to make this clear but i i think that she's going to be a net positive but i'm prepared to be wrong about that yeah i I think that she's probably, I I think she was the best available pick on the board. I think she was the smart pick for Biden to, I mean, she's not the pick to like get the JVL vote. She's, you know, we we ran a piece about her tenure as the attorney general of uh, California several months ago, which will just make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. I mean, really disgusting uh, and, and bad. But on the other hand, this this isn't about making me happy. And I think she is probably a pretty smart pick. I think she is not likely to uh, not likely to switch a lot of votes over to Biden, but she is likely to energize some of the soft Biden voters and is not likely to repel all that many people. I've seen a lot of, oh, well, I was thinking about Biden, but Kamala Harris is just too radical. Right. Forget that. I'm going with Trump. To be honest, anybody who thinks that way, I think they were going to go with Trump eventually. I think anyway. so too. I, like this I, is, I they're just waiting for their off ramp, and this was the off ramp that they that they got. I don't yeah, really they, buy that. There's a huge number of people who are going to be repelled by Harris. No, that that was that was uh, that was a, a pretext. Uh, I think that next week's convention is going to be 
okay, you know, I could either say incredibly boring or incredibly um, interesting, and I could defend both of those things. But uh, I, I do think it's going, you know, the for voters who have been paying attention to Trump, believe it or not, I, Joe Biden has a. <laughs> Okay, this is why, because I, I understand how stupid this is going to sound, because Joe Biden's been around for 40 years, but he does have a chance to kind of introduce himself again to the country. And um, we talked about this yesterday with Steve, uh, uh, with Steve Kornacki, you know, given the fact that the Republicans have invested so much in portraying him as this drooling, doddering, uh, senile old man, he's, there's, there's upside for him giving a reasonably coherent speech, which he's going to give, right? I mean, it's going to give a pretty good speech. I don't know if everybody's going to yeah, watch it. All, all but, of his know. set piece speeches of this cycle have been very good. If you think back to the, his 20, uh, 2012 speech, uh, it was maybe the, it was probably the second best speech of that convention. So that, that was the year that Bill Clinton came in on the, I think the third day of the convention and gave that absolute stem winder, which you know, many people think shifted the momentum finally in, in Obama's favor. But Biden gave a fantastic speech there. He's a very good speaker, uh, especially when he's got his notes and, and a script to go off of. I really wonder. I really wonder what the viewership is going to be like for this. Yeah, I, I do. And wonder I, I got to I mean, everything about it is so weird. You don't have the electricity of it being live, which it, which changes everything about you know, how it comes to you. And, and honestly, I hope that the people on both sides of this are really rethinking it and trying to conceive of it much more like a fireside chat than a traditional political rally mm -hmm. speech. Because I just, on the, on the small screen of your, you know, YouTube or however the networks are going to carry it, it's going to look weird if you are, you know, thumping and giving the big, only I can, you know, American no, Carnage style no speech applause. with yeah, nothing, right. you know, with like, you know, five people standing there. So I don't know. I, I, I could see actually that this could be the year where the conventions almost don't even matter. You know, normally where normally people get bounces no out of them. Yeah. I could I see this being where there's just no bump. The conventions happen and the race just keeps moving in the same, same direction it's been moving. So, so there have been some suggestions that the, uh, the the Trump campaign is really going to be focusing a lot of its attention on on Kamala Harris, going back to uh, to her uh, about her radicalism. You had a piece uh, ways not to attack Kamala Harris. Um, it, 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 we did sort of have this weird cognitive dissonance where you had the lefties, you know, the the Bernie Bros, who were ripping her for not being progressive enough. At the same time, you had folks on the right say, "They see this is the radical AOC pick. Uh, she's going to be." She poses some problems for the Trump campaign in trying to characterize her. Yeah, she she does. And I mean, on the other hand, if we take what I said earlier about the Trump campaign really just wanting to rely on their base, then the fact of Kamala being half black and half Indian is all they really need. You know, all they have to do is keep highlighting that and that will be enough for their voters to energize them. But for everybody else, you know, Kamala is kind of a weather vane politically. She's Clintonian in that way. She's not especially progressive. She's not especially centrist. She seems to go where the votes are. You know, having come from California politics, she came up from the left in the primaries. She she got turned around a couple of times because she wasn't really sure where the right place to be was. But now she's been pulled to the center by Biden. This is you know, so much of this is what you want to see. And in that way, I think that the Biden-Harris ticket is a Rorschach test. And if you are yeah. an anti-anti-Trumper who is just dying to have a reason not to vote for Biden, then you can say, see, she supported Medicare for all once in a once. debate. And she said a bunch of things about maybe packing the court. And so, by God, I cannot support that ticket. And that's one way to look at it, I suppose. The other way to look at it is that uh, Biden gave on a couple places to the left. He gave on Hyde Amendment. He gave on climate change. And then he stood totally athwart the left on all of their big ticket items, on reparations for slavery, on Medicare for all, on decriminalizing the border. He absolutely went out of his way to go against the idea of defunding the police. He went and rewrote the, personally went and rewrote the party platform to get occupation out of the part of the platform dealing with Israel and to condemn the BDS movement. 
so everything I would say, all of the actual evidence, not the wish casting, but the actual things that have been done by the Democratic Party voters and by Biden would suggest the opposite, which is that they have shut down the progressive insurgency and that he has taken somebody who was closer to that end of the spectrum in Kamala Harris and in fact converted her and brought her over to the point where her incentives are now aligned with his. And this I, looks I, to me like a guy who's actually dragging his party closer to the center left. At least at least for the time being, there's actually a really interesting deep dive in the New York Times about how he went about the process and that one of his goals was to elevate all of the women he was uh he was in, you know, he was he was he was looking at that that everyone's career should be enhanced by being on the list as opposed to being destroyed. Um, that didn't completely work out, but also that he was so impressed by so many of the women that they're all going to be part of the administration. So it's it is interesting uh, the way this is actually played out because you're not getting a lot of a lot of sour grapes from the supporters of some of the others. Okay, I have to ask this question because we start off with we're talking about crazy and insanity and everything. How freaked out should we be by the whole mail-in voting uh, controversy? And of course, I bring this up uh, the day after the president uh, makes it very clear that, uh, yeah, he doesn't want universal mail-in voting and uh, you know we need to have more money for the post office to do that. And, I'm, and I am not going to do this. He's all in on all of this in Pennsylvania. You have state officials who are sounding the alarm that maybe the post office can't handle this. I guess I bring this up. If, in fact, this is a five-point race, you could certainly imagine five points being affected one way or another by the confusion, not to mention the post-election. So on a scale of 1 to 100, how freaked out are you about the mail-in voting issue? 7,036. Yeah, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. Is it, I mean, I hope, is it I where, are you? where are you? I, on was, that? I was hoping you were going to talk me down from that. I mean, I uh, <laughs> <laughs> look, never come to me to talk oh, you down from the I, ledge I, of anything. I, I'm like a, a timeshare salesman for ledges. Uh, I, I gotta say, I don't, th when it comes to shenanigans, and, and not shenanigans actually isn't it shenanigans is when you go and copy a bunch of names, names down from the graveyard. Yeah. When it comes to, wholesale, large scale, industrial strength, electoral stealing. Uh, I think that five points is not nearly enough. You could yeah. probably manufacture 20 points in swings. I mean, because mm. you're, you're, I, I look at this and I'm terrified. I hope that I'm wrong. I'm hoping that this turns out to be like the Y2K of, yeah. you know, of this mm -hmm. year. And certainly it could be, you know, I don't, I wouldn't say that it's likely that we'll go into a, something that looks like a failed state where, you know, we can't even have an election held normally, but it looks to me like it's at least a one in 10 proposition, yeah. maybe a one in five proposition. What do you, what do you think, Charlie? Where, where are yeah. you on all this? Well, I'm, I, I worry about it on several levels. Number, number one, whether or not the actual results will be uh, messed with, I mean, will be affected by people being discouraged from voting, um, whether in fact this will suppress the vote. That's number one. Number two, the chaos of election night and the couple of days after the election, uh, when you might have one one result election night, and then it will change as the as the ballots are, are cast and the and the mischief that Donald Trump can do, whether or not we're going to have uh, lawsuits, whether or not Republican legislatures might challenge uh, certain results and have competing electors. I mean, there's the there are some serious nightmare scenarios um, that you know that will leave such long term damage. But again, I hope it is Y two K. By the way, the last time I mentioned Y two K, I got inundated with with IT people saying, oh, no, 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 Y2K was a real thing. And the only reason it wasn't a big problem is because guys like me, we, we solved it. So just, just that, to be clear, out. that's what I mean. I mean, yeah. so Y2K was a real problem right. and people rolled up their sleeves yeah. and they fixed the problem before it happened. Right. And so it's entirely possible that we will get this stuff fixed before we hit the crisis point. Well, also the, the, one of the good, you know, upsides would be that people are now extremely conscious of it. I mean, I, I find myself really sort of thinking through, okay, what am I going to do? Am I going to wait till election day to vote like I used to in the old days. If I vote early, uh, do I mail it or do I take it into the polling place? So 
I think can that you do the, that in Wisconsin? How yes. does it how does it work for you? So you can bring you your absentee ballot with you. Yes, you can bring the 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 actual vote the ballot and go to my voting place. Well, go go to uh, City Hall where I live, and 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 drop it off. So I don't have to worry about it being lost in the post law's office. I don't have to worry about whether or not they're going to put a a you know a stamp on it or not a stamp um, a postmark on on it. So and that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. But I'm seeing from some of the surveys, you know, the large number of people who now are worried about this, which mean, may mean that it will change behavior, that people will be more careful about this. I also think there's a very real possibility that Donald Trump is uh, is suppressing his own vote, that he's discouraging exactly the kinds of people who would be most likely to uh, to, to do the mail-in balloting. Uh, so I, but again, we don't know. We just don't know. But what he's, I mean, so... What he's got to do, though, is he's just got to scramble everything like the if things progress normally, then he will lose. Yeah. And so he needs chaos. And if there's chaos, he could lose, too. He could. But but at least he's got a chance. Right. Because if right. you if you turn the apple cart over and everything spills everywhere, then there's a chance that he you know, things break the right way for him. I got to say, I I don't know that I am going to. I had thought that I would be a mail-in voter and looking at the noises that Bill Barr has made and the the things that other Republicans have decided to say about mail-in voting, I'm not sure I have any confidence yeah. that we will not have a sustained legal challenge to treat mail-in votes or absentee ballots differently from ballots cast at the polling place. Uh, and so I... I think I have to go and like stand in line for six hours. Okay. Well, this is what I'm talking about is, is yeah. that the people are changing, you know, and, and I've thought about that too. And if I had to stand in line for six hours, which probably I wouldn't have to do, but because I live in a smaller community. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. There's no way that I am not going to have my vote counted. So, and I, 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 I sense that, that, uh, that, that, other people are thinking the same thing. And so it's still August. So we've had time to think about this, to game it out, to figure out what's going on. But I mean, there are moments where you think we're now talking about something that would have been absolutely inconceivable, even like five minutes ago, that the president of the United States might F with the postal service in order to make it harder to cast mail-in balloting. That is so bizarre. It, a couple of people on social media saying, you know, this ought to be the lead of every website, every menu, which is true, but we've gotten so used to crazy stuff. No, the president can't actually put political hacks in charge of the postal service, you know, and shut down mail sorters and slow things down so that we can't count votes in a presidential election. That can't possibly happen. Well, yes, it can. I mean, this, is, <laughs> this is what the soft authoritarianism stuff looks like. Like this is this is what Hungary and even the harder stuff like, you know, you see in Belarus. This is what it looks like. Right. You, you have uh, federal state secret police like we have now had with DHS mobilized against the citizenry. You have shenanigans with the actual voting and stuff like that. I, and you have the the actual head of state. Actively seeding the ground to say that the vote may be illegitimate. I mean, it, this is banana republic land, and I don't understand, honestly, any Republican or conservative who isn't out there at the barricades fighting against this right now is playing a very, very dangerous game, and uh, it's dishonorable and foolish at, at best. Well, I agree with that. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us on the Weekend Bulwark podcast. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm a ray of sunshine, Charlie. I would have sunshine. Well, you know, at least we're sounding the alarms. I mean, that's the key thing. And we, and, 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 and we are out there, uh, you know, at the at the barricades. And sometimes it's exhausting, but we're going to stay at the barricades. I was thinking about this whole, you know, fighting Donald Trump thing that 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 we've been doing it basically longer than World War Two. So, oh God, <laughs> it's, 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 you put it that you, way. You, you have to go all the way. Well, I mean, how long was the American Civil War? You know, eighteen sixty one to eighteen eighteen sixty five. You know, I feel like we've been doing this since uh, since 2015. So the key thing is you, you run through the tape. You just don't don't let down your guard until it's over. But um, it's been that long. If it feels like it's been long, it has been a long time. You know, Gary Kasparov says this, that the guys like Trump, what they do is they just want to exhaust you. Right? Yes. So they, they think that if they just persevere, they just keep doing it. Eventually, you will get so sick and tired of 
of fighting that you just decide you just can't do it anymore. Yeah. And uh, you know what, though? There's, there's a reason they use that strategy. You can see why it works because Absolutely. it's exhausting. And uh, I struggle with it. I know that you struggle with it. We all do. And, and, and but is, you have to understand that is the strategy. You know, we get exhausted. He wins. And so, yeah. Anyway, happy weekend. Um, thanks for joining me again. And again, uh, thank you for all listening to the Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday. And there's actually a convention next week. Is that true? Really? An actual sort of quasi-convention. And we'll do this all over again. <laughs>